Welcome to the History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here is your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to the History Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham coming at you today, nearly live. We are in Ottawa, Ontario. As we continue our Northern History Week here at ActiveHistory.ca, I'm at the National Arts Center where for the past few days there has been the Artists Marketplace, which has featured some of the top artists from the North. And today we're going to talk to three of those artists about working in the North and and the changing face of art in the North. And first up, here's my conversation from earlier today with Lynn Fabio. And we are here with Lynn Fabio from Whitehorse. Welcome to the podcast, Lynn. Thanks for doing this. Thank you. Now, your art, which is here as part of Marketplace, is somewhat unique in its style and also in the material used because you use intestine yes. uh, for your art. Mm-hmm. What led you towards using intestine? Well, because I live in the north and in, in the Yukon, I travel, I travel uh, not extensively, but I do have occasion to go to Alaska. And I was on a bicycle trip to Juneau many, many years ago. I can't remember the year, but probably 25 years ago anyways, Um, and in Juneau, at the Juneau Museum, I went to see a show called Inner Skins, Outer Skins, which was a show based on both traditional and contemporary work using intestine, fish skin, and sea mammal intestine, which is, uh, uh, has been a traditional, traditional practice in the North. And I've worked with textiles and fibers all my life. And something about the quality of light... I walked into that museum and I burst into tears. There's something about the quality of light passing through gut, which I find very magical. And I was totally taken with the material and very excited and then went home to Whitehorse and thought, great, but I don't live near a coast. I don't have access to that kind of intestine and sort of gave up (laughs) the idea for a while as much as I was inspired about it. And then many years later, I saw a course being offered in Washington State by a woman who was using pig intestine. Mm. And I thought, well, that's, you know, it might be, looked like it had similar qualities. So I decided to go down and take the course. It was a five-day course. And I learned the basics of working with pig intestine and uh, then just came home and started started working with it, exploring it as an art medium. Mm. And it just took off from there. Yeah. And I've been doing it for, geez, t- probably 14, 15 years now. Now, you mentioned the, the, the light going through it. Is, mm-hmm. is part of that power because of the consciousness that it is an intestine, as opposed to just being some other material through which light can go? Is part of that knowing that it's it's from a, a living being, and that's part of the power. I think it probably is, even even maybe instinctively, even if you if you don't know what it is, mm-hmm. because it's not it's not like clear glass, it's not like like plastic. It is it is translucent, but there's I guess there is there is something that it was once something alive, right? And and I think that that's part of the magic and then once you know just the background some of the history or just the fact that it did come from inside an animal and now it's there and it's it's being used in in the traditional sense in a number of of different ways uh in the tradition the main things that i had seen in the north were the i say parkas but they're not parkas it's actually rain rain gear rain coats that the indigenous people of the far north and mostly in Alaska from my experience made from either seal or walrus intestine mm-hmm. and these were made as as rain gear to protect right. them when they were out fishing or, or whaling so the idea of something coming from inside an animal that becomes a protective outer coating for no. man another right. mammal yeah. is, it, there's, there's that yeah. element of magic or, or yeah. whatever intrigue. Well, it's almost it part is. of honoring the animal. It is. And and that was also part of the tradition yeah. of uh, honoring and the, the garments were used in different ways. There were very the functional garments like the raincoats, but then there were other garments that were used in in ceremony. 
Right. And there was the association with spirit world, that just the sound of gut when it's dry, it has this, this rustling, crackling sound. Right. And there were times when shamans would wear them to when they were doing different ceremonies. And, and again, just that connection between, between the, the sea mammals and man and honoring, honoring the mammal. Um, and I like, for me, the, ide- the idea of using every part of the animal as well. It's yeah. just like you don't, you don't, you know, throw away the bones, and that's part of the, you know, the, the indigenous culture as well. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm wondering, too, then, because the pig intestine is different because it's a thinner mm-hmm. intestine, yes. right? Yeah. So... You can't really use it for utilitarian purposes in the same way as a seal or a walrus. Right. So does that limit what you can do? It does. Yeah. And I, I don't... Well, if I had access to the seal or walrus, I might be making the, the rain gear t- to wear. <laughs> yeah. um, but I don't. And the nature of the pig intestine is, is much thinner, much smaller. So I make miniature clothing... Or the the molded vessels. I don't think that was done traditionally. They might have blown up the stomach or, or intestines and used that uh, as a container. Right. But also because the pig intestine is so thin, I make my vessels by applying many many layers. I've got up to 20, 20 layers. So it's okay. a similar technique to, to paper mache of just right. applying many layers to build up a solid shape. So I work with the gut in, in two different ways. The, that sort of paper mache technique is working with it wet, where you just yeah. apply layers and it sort of sticks to itself. Or else I work with it dry, and in that way I inflate the intestine, yeah. bicycle pump, <laughs> and if, I, if I'm... <laughs> you inflate the intestine with a bicycle pump? Yes. Yes. So in the summer, I attach the bicycle pump to the end of an intestine, and I (laughs) pump it up. And if I'm lucky enough, it gets very frustrating, because usually there's a tiny hole, and it it won't inflate. Okay. But if I manage to get a piece, and sometimes I have to go through many pieces that doesn't have a hole, I can get a beautiful length that I stretch across my yard. Uh And when it dries, if it's totally inflated, it dries like a perfectly straight piece of ribbon. It's a tube, which dries that way. And then it gets flattened out, and then I use it like ribbon or fabric, and I hand sew it. Right. So the piece that I have in this show, which is the large framed parka, which is based on on the, the traditional way of sewing a whole coil of gut, uh, that's what that piece is based on. But it's it's hard to get to find a piece without a little mm-hmm. tiny little right. air hole. I guess in the in the processing of the pig intestine, sometimes they make little nicks so yeah. so it's a lot harder to work with it that way what do your neighbors think of having well, pig intestine uh, they think I'm, I'm weird anyways because <laughs> I collect I also work with with uh, porcupine quills right. and I have yes. people drop off roadkill yeah. at my back door <laughs> right now I have a bag of goose feet in my freezer uh-huh. as well as a bunch of fish skin <laughs> uh, last year uh, in Inufik I've been working for the Great Northern Arts Festival for 12 years now and last year there was uh, an artist there doing goose foot baskets wow. and I was able to take a workshop with her and make a basket myself and work with, with goose feet which is an incredibly tough uh, material, like a leather like material, okay. so I got someone there to send me goose feet <laughs> which I'm hoping to, to work with and yeah. I've done some work with fish skin as well so I just like to incorporate a, a, a lot of different uh, natural elements into my work and I find that living in the north that's part of I spend a lot of time outdoors and it's yeah. just kind of my my source of inspiration and those are things I like to include in my work yeah because that's what I'm I, I was thinking when you're talking about using all these natural materials is it is it you know, a way we, we talked about how it honors the animal mm-hmm. uh, with the pig intestine. Is this a way of maybe honoring the landscape, uh, or in honoring the environment, or celebrating it even? As, as this is something that we can get off the land. Well, with with the pig intestine, I guess not so much. So yeah. we don't have. I mean, right. there, there are a few. They do. Someone does raise pigs in in the Yukon, but it's it's not for me. That's not my idea behind it. My inspiration came from that tradition. Right. If, if I was, uh, you know, if I hunted seal or whatever, I would, I would definitely be 
using that as a way to honor the animal. But I just happened to fall in love with with the material and found something that was similar similar to the seal intestine that I for, so for me right now it's the it's more the qualities of the material that mm-hmm. I like working with but the way I embellish the pieces that comes from my my inspiration of nature which is why I use things like quills and lichen and mm-hmm. moss and seed pods so it's just once I have my basic form yeah. then I add the more natural elements mm-hmm. And is it difficult as a material to use to do that? Um, because you talk about how thin it is and mm-hmm. you know how difficult it is to find a piece that doesn't have a, a little hole in it. Right. I mean, is it? And just looking at the pieces in the show, it looks like it's a very delicate uh, material to work with. Mm-hmm. That someone like me who has zero artistic ability <laughs> would not be able to do at all because you have to be very fine with it and very careful. Right. Uh, is, is that? Am I, am I right about that, or, or is um, it tougher than I'm, I'm giving it credit it's, for? I, I wouldn't say it. Technically, it's not difficult. I mean, okay. you, you, you know, I buy, I buy the gut intestine. It's, it's basically sausage casing, right. which is quite easily accessible from a butcher. Yeah. And I clean it. You must, well, it come, your butcher it comes, must love you. It, come, it comes packaged in salt, so it is already cleaned. I okay. wash the salt off. So the basic technique of of you know washing it layering it that's pretty simple they say it's like paper mache you get your form you layer it i allow uh, a day between each layer so that the time so but beyond that it's not like it's technically very difficult so i think it's like like a lot of mediums people could say well paint is really simple you put paint on and you apply it to canvas it's it's what you do right with what you do with it yeah and of course over the years i've working with it that much i've and i'm still learning about it the way the gut shrink like initially doing a very simple shape it's so you layer it you let it dry you have your shape yeah but learning how the gut shrinks in different ways will affect a piece so i'm learning different techniques to to kind of get around that when I don't want it to shrink in a certain way or even how to store it how to I've started working with dyeing dyeing the gut using things like berries to uh, to dye it and I found out at one point I put a bunch of gut into I had been making black currant jelly and didn't want to throw away the pulp felt like they didn't want to waste it so I threw in a bunch of gut and stuck it in the fridge and forgot about it and found that the quality, I guess the acid in the berry juice stopped the gut from going going rotten. When, oh. I, when I keep it in the fridge, when I'm working over a period of time, I just yeah. keep it in water and I have to change the water every right. three days or it just goes <laughs> rank, you know. But th- with the berry juice, it just stopped it from going rotten and wow. smelly. So just working with anything over a long period of time, I'm still learning yeah. about, about the material. So I find that... That's exciting, too. And do you think that your work is expressive of the North uh, as a region? I know, mm-hmm. like, because other people, you've, you've mentioned that other people have worked with intestine, and I yes. know you, you went to Russia, I yes, believe. Yes, I went to Siberia. Right, and mm-hmm. to, to do a bit, some cultural exchange and te- try and teach some right. folks over there similar materials. But it, it strikes me as something that, I mean, if someone were to tell me, just, you know, there's someone who's working with intestine. Mm-hmm. What region of Canada do you think they'd be from? Right. My first guess would probably be the north. And I don't know if that says anything about me as a person, but it, it seems like it's something that, uh, and maybe part of this tradition of when we think of the north, we think of the environment, we think of the land and, and mm-hmm. the, the, uh, the animals as well, and part of that honoring tradition that I think comes through strongly in northern heritage. Right. So I, I'm wondering if, if you if you feel that in your work and you feel as though what you do is part of that heritage or celebrates the North uh, w- hmm. in a way that's broader than just each individual piece. Right. I, I don't know. Like, <laughs> consciously, yeah. it, it's not... I can't sure. say that that's... And, and, and maybe it is, you know, somewhere in there. For me, you know, the fact that I discovered this medium comes from... From living in the north, yeah, and and just experiencing, seeing a lot of of those garments, which I was fascinated with, and I say it was a material I liked, and and you know I don't know if I had still been living in Montreal, which is where I grew up, and discovered if if I would have continued 
to go on to work with the medium. Right. It's, it's hard to say. Yeah. Uh, but it has become, I think people, people always think of it as the North. In my first few years in Inuvik, the work, I was grouped with the traditional, traditional crafts people, even uh-huh. though it's, I mean, the tradition of using, I guess of using any animal parts, you think of the North, or, or cultures that use, yeah. that hunt or fish and use every part of the animal. Right. So I think people think of that often as a more Northern yeah. thing. Hmm. Yeah. And just for the record, you're quoted as saying it's not as bad as someone might think using gut. In terms of... In terms of, like, smell and, I know. and all that. People, people, like, when I talked to people about this, when I was putting it, together the stuff for the, the, the show, I was mentioning that, you know, there's right. someone here who's coming and worked with gut. And the mm-hmm. question, first question was, one, why? And I tried <laughs> right. to explain to them based on what I know about you. And two, it was like, that must be not fun. Yeah. That you must, like, run around with gloves on all the time and nose right. plugs in. And, and Well, that's what, because I'm using... The pig intestine, which comes comes as sausage. Sure. I have had access to get fresh caribou gut and Ooh. reindeer gut, which had not been cleaned. Also, okay. moose gut. Okay. And yes, I was wearing gloves, yeah. and it was a very smelling, <laughs> <laughs> smelly uh, process. But I dealt with it because that's yeah. that's part of exploring exploring the medium. Right. So if if I and actually just recently I put out or made a connection with a friend who goes bison hunting every year wow. in the Yukon. And I'm hoping next year to get some bison intestine to see if that will be bigger or something that I will be able to use. Wow. The caribou, I got some caribou, and the caribou was was a lot smaller. Well, the caribou and reindeer were a lot smaller than the, than the pig, and it was just it just made working with it and making larger pieces really difficult. Okay. It was just too small right. to work with. So yeah. for now I'm using pig. I have done some work with cow as well yeah. but I find on the cow there's a lot more a lot more fat and, and okay. greasy bits which I'm mm-hmm. concerned about kind of not lasting or, right. or getting yeah. little little insects interested yeah. in it or, yeah. or whatever. Because yeah. Yeah. Th- that, that would be a concern, right? Because mm-hmm. it's a biodegradable material yes right so yeah. you gotta that, that'd be a major issue right and that, i have uh, talked to a conservator who said even though my pieces are especially my vessels have been dried a lot of them have a stain on or wax she says in the long term it's still possible that you know something some little yeah little bugs might get yeah. in there um also i find it interesting and i put a note when people buy my pieces on the care of the piece that even though the pieces can have a stain or an ink or wax on them that pets can still find them attractive and yeah. end up chewing <laughs> chewing yep. on your art piece so it has to be stored <laughs> away from <laughs> pets that might uh, find it <laughs> somewhat attractive but. and you know I mean and, and just looking through the work that's here I mean I found a quote of you saying that you know each gut is like each person or each pig they're mm-hmm. individual and you know it's, it'd be impossible to replicate each piece because the material is so varying from gut to gut. It, it just is. changes, and, yes. it, and it really makes it a distinct piece, even right. within this the material that's unique mm-hmm. from from art. Within that context, each piece is going to be unique and distinct. Right. Even all all the, all the you know, I get I get bundles I buy in bulk now, yeah. um, and. It, as you say, it'll just the way every person is different, yeah. every animal is different, every and even within one length of gut. If I'm doing something specific where I want, I want the look to remain uniform. I you know I try and use the like one length, so like from one pig. Right. But even within that, the texture is going to vary, and then that affects the finish, especially in my layered pieces where you have up to 20 layers of gut. My background is, is as a printmaker mm. and I did uh, collagraphs, which are very textural plates. And I found early on when I started working working with gut that in my layered pieces, when I do the final staining, when I choose to stain a piece, I never know what's going to turn out because right. because of the many layers of gut that have been applied, the texture builds up, and that's not obvious until you until you put stain on. And I basically ink them like a, a collagraph plate mm. or an etching plate, and, right. and then it's like, wow, that's yeah. you know, I, 
I just didn't see it there. So that's another part of the yeah. the, the, the fascination of, of working with that. At the very last minute, I might get a, a total surprise. Yeah. Well, it's, it's really great stuff, and I've loved looking at it here. And uh, So anyway, so Google Lynn Fabio yeah. and yeah. find her work. It's, it's really quite remarkable. And while it may not sound aesthetically pleasing, it really is. It's really beautiful, our beautiful pieces. It is. So. Yeah. Uh, I hope you're enjoying your time in Ottawa. I'm having a wonderful time. Uh, this terrific. is a very exciting event, and I'm very honored mm-hmm. to have been invited to participate. Well, we're in thrilled, thrilled to have you here. So in, yeah. enjoy the rest of your time in the city, and thank you so much thank for you. doing this. Thank you. All right, and as we continue on with our discussion with some of the visual artists here at part of Marketplace, we welcome to the podcast from Happy Valley Goose Bay, Labrador, Shirley Morehouse, who's waving to the audience. Good afternoon. Good evening all out there in podcast land. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you so much for doing this. Oh, I'm... thank you very much for asking me as well, my dear. So, as I mentioned, you're from Happy Valley, Goose Bay, Labrador. And, and so, where exactly would that be uh, if we're looking on the map? Okay. Well, Happy Valley, Goose well, Bay. Well, Happy Valley, Goose Bay is in the center of Labrador. We're situated on the mouth of a really big... Uh, Lake Melville is probably big enough to be an inland sea. It's fresh water and meets uh, salt water, so we have a, a diversity of climate there, diversity of environment and diversity of animals and fish. So uh, it's a very beautiful place. Our, where I live now, we're uh, flanked by the Mealy Mountains. You, I could look out of my back window and see the Mealy Mountains go one side, and there's the river flowing along as well. So it's a beautiful place. It's uh, we're just over uh, into the boreal forest. A couple of hundred miles, you go north, and then you go out of the boreal forest into the taiga, into the tre- treeless area. So I'm in the area now where we have spruce trees, birch trees, mountain ash, uh, willows, uh, lots of berries, lots of fresh water. Uh, so it's a beautiful place. We have a really big sky over us. So it's a wonderful place to live. One, one of the things I've noticed is, is I think when we think of the north or when we hear the term north, a lot of people immediately think of the territories. And we don't consider the northern part of Quebec and northern parts of, uh, of Labrador. And I'm just wondering, locally, how does the community view itself? Does it view itself as part of the north or does it view itself as part of Labrador or, or is it a self-sustaining in its own community? It's, how do you, how do you situate yourself? It's a very difficult thing to try to situate yourself in Labrador because we're in such a geographically diverse area. We're to the right of Quebec, and so we're uh, basically cut off from mainland Canada by Quebec, and the boundary dispute between Quebec and Labrador, like Quebec and Newfoundland and Labrador, was an ongoing situation. Our boundary has changed over the centuries through, like, the the Hundred Years' War between England and France. So Labrador was one of the first areas in the New World that was uh, touched by Europeans. So Labrador people had the first contact with Europeans. And so with that, the Inuit and the Innu, you know, especially the Inuit people, they had uh, a longer time with the Europeans. So we lost our language a lot sooner than a lot of people. They tried to colonize us a lot sooner because of this influence, you know, because of the resources and the fish. But the thing about Labrador is um, we're in a peculiar situation because we're in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. Labrador is the mainland part of Canada. Newfoundland is a little rock island portion out in the middle of the Atlantic to the south of us. Even though there are smaller area geographically, you know, they still rule Labrador from centralized government down in St. John's. The thing about Labrador is, well, being cut off from the mainland by Quebec and from going any further east because we're cut off to the east by the Atlantic Ocean, um, our um, traditions, I could say, our traditions and culture, even though that we have been touched longer than a lot of Canadians uh, or Aboriginal Canadians uh, by the Europeans. We still maintained our traditions as best as we could. And uh, with the isolation, it was uh, 
good in one way because it maintained our culture, and another thing that maintained the Labrador culture was the Moravians, you know, the religious group. Uh, they helped to keep the Inuktitut language, some of the Inuit cultures up in name. But uh, I think a lot of people, since we are on the east coast of Canada, people think uh, we're not north, you know, like we're east. Mm. Uh, but uh, geographically, weather-wise, temperate-wise, we could be uh, in the subarctic. You know, Labrador is such a big area that uh, some parts of our uh, we're in boreal forest, and then we're in the treeless tundra, and then we are up north. Yeah. Yeah, so our province is so big, my dear, that we have two time zones. You know, so yeah. it's uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's very yeah. interesting to live over there. People from up north, I think that they think that we're not far enough north to be considered the north, okay. and then the people from uh, the rest of Canada think, well, they're too far east, so they're not yeah. north. So we're still up in that in between stage of okay, yeah, they are up north, but they're not really up north. Yeah, yeah. and another thing was uh, with as I was saying about this. Uh, European contact. It wasn't until the 1960s, early 70s, that the Inuit people of Labrador were legally recognized as a, to be an Inuit. Hmm. You know, the federal and the provincial government both said that, you know, there are no Inuit people living in Labrador, even though they had uh, ancient maps to say right. Eskimo land and all of that, the land right. of the Red Indian and everything, but even though they had that historical map, they still didn't want to uh, say that they had people living in that <laughs> region. So if they, wow. if they closed their eyes to it, they did not have to provide any societal, economic, health, schooling, right. you know, infrastructure, law, anything, my dear. So oh. it was, we were lost in limbo, mm. you know, for till the 70s, I'd say, yeah. yes. And it wasn't until the 60s that, that my mother... Her mother, uh, my dad, his father, mother, whatever, they weren't allowed to drink, they weren't allowed to vote, so even then you were non-entities. Right. So, so that was only a few years ago, considering, you know, like a generation ago, so it's uh, taken, I am glad that the Inuit people have persevered, and I am thankful for, like, the Inuit Purisat Canada you know, for helping us to get us to where we are today. Right. You know, like, and I'm glad that they think, okay, well, maybe we're not the true North strong and free, but we are part of the North, yeah. you know, like, and we associate with the North because we're Inuit people, even right. though we may be a little bit more South than yeah. what the average people think of the true North. To me, Labrador is the North. Yeah. yeah. And it's interesting that you talk about this, you know, recent change in the community in terms of government recognition because a lot of your art is, is focused on your Inuit heritage uh, and your traditions and I'm just wondering how has that influenced your art and I guess we should say you, you're a painter and also uh, wall hangings uh, and a poet and poets yes. and, and on and on and, yes. and just, you know yes. but uh, you know here the, the stuff you have here um, uh, specifically um, you know, how, how has that heritage influenced you? And given the difficulties Inuit people have had with dealing with the government and uh, having that recognition, uh, how much of your art then is part of asserting that, asserting that place in Canada and reclaiming the, the part of Canada's story that has been taken away from you th by the government through European contacts? I do my art because the creator makes me do my art. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I have to do it. If I don't do it, I get the jitters or yeah. whatever. <laughs> this. But the thing about the art and how I uh, do my art is I originally started to do my art to try to reclaim some of my own personal space. Right. You know, like, uh, reclaiming a part of my own personal space, you know, by taking a part of my grandparents' culture, my mother's culture, my grandfather's and, her, and my dad's culture, you know, like trying to reclaim it was strengthening me in a way that I didn't realize. Uh, I can't speak in Nuktituk, you know, like my mother, she was a, a translator for the justice systems, you know, like medical, legal, whatever, but she, she went to the residential school system. 
and she never wanted her children to suffer the hardships that they had suffered through right. it. And she wanted us to get the best education that we could. So she did the best, they did the best that they thought they were doing, you know, without realizing, you know, like what they were doing was almost like artificially cutting us off from a part of an act of culture. And, you know, so there's a little scar material there, yeah. you know, and then you try to pierce through that scar, but sometimes you just have to leave that scar and try to grow in another way and this art has helped me grow in another way because it made me more open to myself but it also made me more open to the Inuit culture and not only once I started to get open to that I was more aware of Aboriginal culture as a whole you know in Canada and then I got to more be more aware of the culture within Canada mm-hmm. itself you know, so art has um made me grow personal as a, a woman, as a, as a Canadian citizen. It made me grow as a, an Aboriginal woman, and in particular as an Inuit artist. And it seems as though there's great spirituality in doing, in doing this, in pursuing the art. When I do my work, whatever it may be, I always make sure that I'm focused. I'm grounded. I try to make sure that I'm in the best place I could be mentally and physically and spiritually. When I sew, uh, with every stitch that I sew, I try to send out a positive thought into my work. And then I try to pray when I'm uh, working on it as well. So the people who either buy it or even have a chance to look at it, they get a, I hope that they get a sense of the, the spirit that's going into it you know, the heart that's going into it, the thought that's going into it. And so when they look at it, they could feel the, the, the spirit of the person who made it to try to um, maybe not, cr- yes, caress, caress the viewer in an intimate way, you know, mentally and physically and emotionally. You know, like, so it's, it's not just looking at a painting or just looking at a wall hanging. and I want them to uh, go into a state of relaxation. So when they look at it a little bit further, then they could see a little bit further than what they originally thought they could see, you know? Mm-hmm. I don't, that's only... I try to let them experience what I'm experiencing at right. the time when I'm making yeah. that piece. Right. Yes. You were talking about, you know, your parents and your grandparents and uh, how when you're, you're doing your art, you're taking parts of them as well. And I'll speak just for my example. Mm-hmm. Like, I know personally, you know, in education, my grandmother always talks about how her mother would put such an emphasis on education because, you know, so my great-grandmother didn't have the opportunity yes. to, to pursue education. Yes. And, and so that has been, you know, my grandmother's told me focus, this focus, since, since I was focus, five years old. Yes. So, so my pursuit of education is partly yes. because of this family yes. legacy and that's been passed down to me. And, and how much of art for you is not only this this legacy that you're getting from your parents, your grandparents, and, and onward, but also to pass it down to the next generation the way that this education stuff has been passed down to me. Is, is that a focus of what you're doing and part of your motivation? Yes, education. It was When I first started doing this, I wanted to show my daughters. I have three daughters. I wanted to show my daughters what my mother and my grandmother had taught me. You know, like I wanted to show them how this stitch was done, you know, why this is cut this way and why that is cut this way. You know, I wanted to show them, okay, this is the seal skin, this is why it was done, this is why this is particular part of it was used. You know, I wanted to show them, you know, because my daughters, uh, they were born over in Europe, so when we came back to Canada, they were completely new to it. You know, they were dropped in on the the deep end of it because uh, they were not exposed to that type of life when they lived over in Europe. Mm -hmm. But uh, when we made numerous trips back to Labrador and they seen my dad uh, cutting up a seal, you know, like taking uh, cleaning the seal, taking the fur off, or cutting up a caribou, or 
uh, cleaning a fox or whatever, <laughs> skinning the fox and stretching it. They just automatically assumed that everybody in Canada did that. Right. You know, like they did, you know, because they were so young, they yeah. thought, oh, they're coming back from Europe now, they're coming over to Canada yeah. where everybody cuts up seals and cuts up <laughs> caribou, and then you go downstairs and there's, you know, a whole, whole big pile of foxes that's waiting to be, to be stretched. Yeah, so it, it, was a, it was for an education for them to uh, pass down, you know, the little bit that I learned, you know, so that they had the knowledge of the, my information, right. you know, because um, in our culture we never had the written word, you know, like it was just an oral history, right. you know, and at the time, you know, the, the governments did not rely on oral history as a, a concrete evidence, you know, mm-hmm. everything had to be written down, yep. but I'm glad to hear now that they have said, okay, oral history, you know, oral history this, oral history yeah. that, now that, you know, a lot of the seat, uh, elders have passed on, you know, and their stories have finished, but uh, this is my way of trying to pass on the little bit that I was able to right. glean from my grandparents mm-hmm. and, and my parents, and so, and also as well, it was a way of an education to try to teach the general public, you know, right. of the different things that we do. Right. Yes. Uh, and one of the things you're known for is your integration of different materials. Uh, so you, you use what would be termed traditional uh, materials like uh, I got tan smoked caribou hide, yes. wool, sinew, felt, yep. and then non traditional materials that you combine the two. I could tell you about the tan uh, smoked caribou skin is not traditional to the Inuit. It's uh, is traditional to the Innu. The okay. Innu are another Aboriginal group. There, there are some groups in Labrador and some parts in uh, southern Quebec with the Innu. And so, but they were the caribou people. And But we used a lot of that caribou. We, we used every part of the caribou, but we never tamed it. But I loved okay. the the texture, buttery texture mm. of it. I love the, the variation of colors that you can get through this different tanning processes. And uh, yeah. it was a lot easier to use. I couldn't take uh, like seal skin products across the border because of the right. sea mammal, yeah. but I could take caribou skin. So it was uh, the viability of this against that. Mm-hmm. And I had access to uh, the caribou skin where I never had the real access to tanned. Uh, seal skin, so that was one reason why I used that. But I like using different materials. I use uh, locks and keys, chains, uh, bubble wrap, you know, <laughs> whatever found objects. I take apart earrings. I'll reposition and make them into something else. Whatever comes my way, and I say, well, this will fit perfectly in this scene here. I don't care what people think about it. It fits. And if it fits and it works, it's good enough for me. But one of the sort of counters to this then is that you're not making Inuit art. And, and it's, it's a, a, a sentiment that people are saying, this is what Inuit art is. You're not making this traditional Inuit art, Inuit art so therefore you don't fit within this category. And I find your response to this really powerful and really moving. Um, Inuit art is art created by Inuit people. You know, like, it's just... It, it doesn't matter what we use, you know, like we're, we don't have to be stuck back in the 15th century chunking at a chunk of uh, rock with a pickaxe and a file, you know, like and say, okay, we have to do it because this is the traditional way to do it. You know, like I could counter to the average person today to say, okay, then I see you out there driving your car. Why aren't you doing out there using your horse and buggy or, or walking along? Mm-hmm. Or why aren't you still using a broom instead of a vacuum cleaner? Right, yeah. You know, everybody yeah. progresses. You know, yeah. like, and if you don't progress and you don't change, you're static and you're dead. Mm-hmm. You know, and so Inuit art is a whatever Inuit people want it to be. Right, yes. so it doesn't fit within this box. No. Uh, we're not in a box. You right. know, the time you're in a box is when you're six feet under. And if you don't <laughs> want to be in a box six feet under, you're burnt. You know, so if you want to be in a box, well and fine. Put yourself in a box, but don't put any other people in there with your preconceived notions. That's right. what I say. Yeah, So, it, it, and it's really nice because it shows the evolution, not just of the art, but yep. of, of the community and where you where you come from, where you grew up, and, and it shows that there's a vibrance there and, and that this community is, is ever-changing the way that all communities are. Yes. And, and the art is an, an expression of that. Yes. 
and that's it, you know, like, even with technology now, there's a, not only in your art, but all art across the board, you know, like, it's, a lot of it is done by computer nowadays, you know, right. like, you know, you can't keep people back with preconceived notions, right. old, outdated, outmoded, yeah. you, you may as well go back to the, uh, stone and chisel, if you, <laughs> yes, exactly, yeah. if you want to be writing a newspaper right. or whatever, you know, like, get with it, mm. yes. Mm. And have you noticed that there is, uh, that it, when people see your art, that they are surprised by it? That if they come in and they, exp- they, they see Shirley Morehouse, Inuit artist, and they come in and you're using new techniques, new materials, have you found that your audiences are surprised by this? Uh, in one way, but they're very, very pleased as well. You know, they're, they're pleased to see the variation. You know, like I'm, I'm sure that there is um, a lot of people out there who like to look at the traditional art, you know, like, and this is well and fine. I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with traditional art if you want to be true, if you want to be traditionalist. You know, like, everybody is different. Everybody follows a different path. If you want to be traditionalist, do that, my dear. Ink, pencil, lithograph, stone, whatever. But if you want to be trying something different, you know, like, no one should be able to stop you and say, you can't do this because this is not your genre. You know, like... Mm -hmm. Whatever, you know, they can't see inside of your mind and they can't see what you're trying to express. Right. You know, and people should not try to censor what somebody else is trying to express, you know, like art wise anyway, you know? Yes, art wise. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Because, yeah, it's a very personal expression. Yes. Of of whatever it is you're trying to express. And there's different motivations, different purpose behind each piece. Yes, indeed, my dear. You know, like, I know that there should be a stop put on some sort of expression, you know, like <laughs> pornography and all that sort of stuff. I, I'm not talking about that sort of thing. I'm, I'm talking about uh, law-abiding art. You know, like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know what I mean, yeah. eh, my dear? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So if people want to find your stuff, how, what's the best way they do that? You could contact me or, you know, you Google as well. Google is, I'm, yeah. I'm on Google. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's Googled nowadays. <laughs> yes, yes, so... Basically, they could uh, see my work in, like, the Indian and Northern Affairs it used to be. They used to, they had just purchased some of my work in their okay. in their uh, collection. I have some works down in the, the rooms, and some other, and there's a National Gallery has a piece of mine. So I'd say Google me. That's probably the best. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Terrific. So that is Shirley Morehouse all the way from Happy Valley, yes. Goose Bay, Labrador. Thank you so much Thank for doing this. Thank you very this. much there, everyone in podcast land. I hope you enjoy it. And now we will welcome into the podcast... John Sabrin, welcome to the podcast. Hello, thank you. Thanks for doing this. So, we were just talking, you're from Fort Simpson, Northwest Territories. Yes. Uh, currently living in Yellowknife, but from Fort Simpson. Yes. And uh, you said about seven hours west, west of, Yellowknife. Of, of Yellowknife. And you're a member of the Decho First Nation, Yes. part of a, a wider Dene culture. And for you, that has really been a, a strong inspiration to your art as a carver and also a painter. Mm-hmm. You know, what has that influence been on your work as an artist? Well, I think a lot of it has to come with uh, from stories and legends. Growing up, I was always surrounded by um, elderly people who talk in, you know, in the, the Dene language and talk about stories. So I've always been fascinated by um, my dad telling me stories when he was a young man about being in a boat, a um, birch bark boat that they made. Uh, spruce boughs and spruce root to tie it using a string to tie them all together and mm. they used to go um, beaver hunting in the morning Right. and um, there'd be two or three of them in the boat and sometimes I remember them talking about it used to be foggy so they didn't know where they were going sometimes yeah. and they'd come across thick bush mm. and I used to think about that as a kid and, and as an artist I can just imagine well, what happened if they decided that they do shape shifting, mm. so they turn into their own mythical creatures. Right. So I did a boat um, series a few years ago, which is now in at the Prince of Wales Museum in Yellowknife. It was a boat where uh, they had shape shifting animals in the boat canoeing down the, mm. the creek. So, oh, cool. Yeah. You know, you talk about telling these stories, and in a lot of your sculpt uh, sculptures, there's multiple characters. You're not, there's not just one thing, and, and everything sort of is intertwined, and you're telling a narrative. Now, as an artist, is that difficult to incorporate all these different elements in one piece? 
It is. Sometimes when you have a bad piece of stone where it's fractured mm. and something falls off, then you have to arrive at a new challenge where how can you make the best of that right. and do something else. Mm-hmm. So I've always tried to do, um, in the past, where I've always tried to do too much, put squeeze too much animals in there and too much action it was and sometimes people go man that's so much it's so busy mm-hmm. so I've learned to as an artist to figure out how to downsize if you want to call right. it that <laughs> so yeah. there's there's less things happening and, right. and more um, free flowing lines which I use in a lot of my carvings free flowing lines to represent northern lights right yeah. and it's, it's a way to sort of celebrate the connection then between humans animals and then the land right yes a friend of mine used to call that um, um, the spirit being connected mm. and that was the music flowing out of the spirit mm. so I, I've always liked that and do you think that the connection that, that maybe in southern Canada maybe the connection and our awareness of the land and nature isn't as strong as the north because it seems to me and I was talking with Leonard Linklater uh, earlier this week uh, the playwright at Justice and he was saying that in his opinion, sometimes we aren't aware that we're on land that has been inhabited for thousands of years by people who come before us, and therefore we don't have that same reverence, perhaps, for the land. So do you think that that's a stronger theme in Northern art, that it's something that we need maybe to incorporate more in, in Southern Canada? Um, well, I think so. I, I think a lot of people um, really take for granted going to the parks, Canada for the weekend or the long weekend right. or going to their cottage or something north yeah I, I mean being from the north there's a vast um, openness to the land I mean you can drive out of an hour at a yellow knife and you come across a little community called Bechico mm-hmm. and you drive past that an hour and there's nothing right. I mean there's, there's yeah. no city there's no farm there's there's nothing there's just trees Mm-hmm. Buffalo, I mean caribou and moose. Right. And so it's, it's all open. I mean, you can w- walk through it and not come across a single soul. Right. Uh, it's, it's it's pretty open. Mm. And everyone who, or a lot of people who have been up there, and even people this week who are who are down for the festival, have talked about the majesty of it. Mm-hmm. That it's really overwhelming. Yes. Um, a, a powerful scene just to see nature at its that, that's been um, untouched almost by humans. Yeah, I wrapped it down the uh, Nahani River a few years ago, and uh, you see grizzlies walking on the, the cliff sides. You see dull sheep. You see rabbits. You see uh, mm. ptarmigans. Mm. You, you see. I mean, if you decide you want to get a fishing pole, you catch grilling. I mean, it's just you, you come across fresh berries and fresh air. I mean, right. It's, it's great. One of the themes that I found for a lot of people here at the festival is that. Uh, or at least First Nations people who are here, is the the sense of passing on these traditional stories uh, that have been you know passed along for again thousands of, of years or, or at least many generations. And how much of that is part of your work and a desire to inform the next generation of these stories and these traditions? Uh, well, that's what I've been doing. I've been um, going to schools in Yellowknife. Uh-huh. and teaching carving and explaining about my culture and some of the stories that I have taken to create a carving. So, and I come, I used to um, come down to Halliburton School of Art and teach there for about a week. Okay. And every year, I'd always find that I have the same student <laughs> coming in because they enjoyed listening to the stories right. about my, my culture yeah. and, and what I, when I'm teaching them. Mm-hmm. So. Now, and we were just talking, and you've been here uh, several times for yes. the Winter Lute Festival, yes. working uh, with snow. Yes. And we were talking a little bit about the materials a little bit, and between snow and, and the various types of stone that you use, is there a partif- particular material that you prefer or that maybe is easier to get that expressiveness that is critical to your work? Well, all three of them are uh, different mediums, but they're all a challenge. Mm. Um, myself, as an artist, I like to be challenged. If I don't really find that I'm challenged, I find that I get bored. Right. And I decide I want to do something different. Mm. 
So I think as an artist myself, I can uh, play with snow. I can play with ice and and, uh, and have fun with it. Right. And try to be the best um, ice carver at that moment, or the best snow carver at that moment to create something, something beautiful mm. for um, I guess for people to to enjoy to look at. Mm. And we were um, grateful enough to win in 2007 in Gatineau. Right. So it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Is there different inspiration based on the material? Uh, yeah, because you, the because um, you, when you're removing snow, you're removing hundreds of pounds of snow. Right. So you're cutting like 200 pound blocks, 200 pound blocks, and you're throwing it down on the ground. So you're starting from the top up. Mm-hmm. So you, it's just a, basically a lot of shoveling, a lot of back breaking work going down. Right. So. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't mind working with stone because it's easy, it's smaller, mm-hmm. um, it's, it's still, it's, it's hard labor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, one of the things that I found about you, or found out, or a quote that uh, I found from you, that you uh, in an interview with the CBC, you said, quote, no one was a fine artist in my hometown, so it never occurred to me that I would be a painter carver. I started reading art magazines and thought, hey, I could do this. Absolutely. I, I remember that comment in the conversation because uh, as an artist, there's no, um, at the time, there's nobody really to look up to. I mm. mean, everybody um, at home wanted you to go to school and learn a trade. Right. So that was sort of like economics. You had to go to work nine to five to make a job. And, there's, and growing up, um, you were kind of like not taken seriously if you if you had a craft or not. <laughs> So, but now I love going home and, and teaching the school and, and little art festivals in my hometown. Mm-hmm. Everyone to carve, teach them how to carve. Right. So now it's different now. Now they have a festival. They have photographers, painters, mm-hmm. uh, people who do ceramics. So they have a wide variety of artists there now. So yeah. from the day when I was growing up, it was, it was different. You, you, we were just talking. You had a show earlier this month in Vancouver. Yes. Which you said went really well. Yes. And, and you were sold out in five days. Yep. And as you growing up, you said you didn't really have anyone to look up to in terms of being an artist, a professional mm-hmm. artist. Mm-hmm. You know, now you're finding a strong market for your art. Do you think you can serve as that inspiration in, in addition to just going into the schools and teaching them how to, how to carve as a professional artist, serve as that inspiration for the next generation uh, growing up in Yellowknife? Well, um, the North is such um, a wide... A place. I mean, some communities. It's a flying community. Uh-huh. So every time I go north, I'm always taking people's emails. And now that there's Facebook, everyone can network. Right. So we, there's always conversations. John, where can I get this? John, where can I get that? I mm-hmm. mean, well, you can get this tool from the store. You can get it cheaper at this other store. Right. So there's always a network of people saying, where can I get tools or material? Mm. And being in the north and having a network and people calling me. And, they want me to come into their, their their school and teach them how to carve and bring materials. And I also bring um, all of the experiences that I had and all the knowledge and all the connections that I met across Canada. Right. Is that maybe overcoming one of the biggest challenges of being a professional artist then? Uh, you know, having these connections through the Internet makes everybody a little more accessible mm-hmm. than it would have been previously to help not only, you know, help, you know, ta- have this, create these dialogues to improve the actual work, but also to market yourself. Yes, everything is pretty much packaged now in, in, in the marketplace where you have to go on business cards, pamphlets, right. information about um, yourself as an artist, because you're out there almost every day selling your, yourself and, and selling your name mm-hmm. and, you, and selling your product. So a lot of people, um, when I go back home, I always tell them that, that you are selling a market, you are selling yourself right. in, in the marketplace. Right. Yeah. You know, you talk about the stories that you want to tell, or that you tell through your art, and, you know, the, the line representing the Northern Lights. Is there one particular story that you have recreated on multiple occasions because there's more meaning to you, or, or is there one particular story that really stands out? Well, there's one, um, it's called Raven Rebirth, um, which... A lot of people love it. A lot of people find that they're connected to it. And I find galleries want, want it in their um, their gallery. Mm. So it's one of those carvings where I do a variety of different sizes and and um, and send to the galleries where people always want them. Right. So 
It's, I mean, I don't mind making them. I mean, I get bored with them. I want to yeah. do something a little different with them every right. single time. Right. So it's <laughs> not really the same. So with that, John Sabrin, thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. So there you have it. Three of the North's top artists who are here for Marketplace as part of Northern Scene at the National Arts Center. My thanks to Lynn Fabio, Shirley Morehouse, and John Sabrin. I'd also like to thank Marnie Richardson, Laura Danker, Carla Wolf at the National Arts Center for their help in setting everything up. We'll be back tomorrow with another History Slam episode as part of Northern History Week here at activehistory.ca. If you have any questions or comments for the podcast, you can find me, historyslam, at gmail.com, Twitter, at Dr. Shawnee Fever. And if you're out and you see Enrico Palazzo, please say hi for me. Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Check out activehistory.ca for more features and articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes. 